to the Raising Kellen podcast. My name is Marsh Naidu and I blog at RaisingKellen.org. On today's episode number 48, we are going to talk with Linda Fries, a occupational therapist from Florida who is very much involved in the hippotherapy scene. Guys, and as always, remember that this information today is for educational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice. Today's episode is brought to you by Healing Horses, a therapeutic riding center here in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Good morning, guys. Today I am talking with Linda Fries, a occupational therapist based in Florida. And Linda is going to be talking to us about hippotherapy, its history, and what makes horse riding an effective riding tool. Now, Linda and I do have some history together, and uh, we ca- we actually met on the Wyatt Collective, which is a group of therapists that um, uh, that talk about pediatric care uh, that are based worldwide. And uh, Mindy Silver from New Zealand has actually created that subscription. Um, based group. Um, I would highly recommend the Y Collective for those therapists that want to get into pediatrics. We are going to kick off the podcast now with Linda Fries. Linda, good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Marsh. Linda, I'm pretty interested. What got you into occupational therapy? What started your journey and put you on the trajectory of becoming an OT? Well, I started riding horses in Massachusetts when I was about six years old, and I kept doing it until I was probably 16. Took a break for the last few years of high school and college, went back to it um, after I graduated, bought my first horse when I was 30, And not too terribly long after that, I read a magazine article about therapeutic horseback riding. And I thought, oh, how magnificent. What a great way for me to to knit together one of my passions with community service work. So I started volunteering uh, with the Loudoun County 4-H therapeutic riding program um, as both a horse leader and a sidewalker. Um, After about a year, I went to the Chef Center in Michigan and completed their month-long training program for therapeutic riding instructors and um, came back and worked for a year and decided, you know what, I love this. I love the kids. I love what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to go back to school and get my master's in OT. And at that point, it was sort of like, do I want to go back and get another bachelor's degree because my undergraduate degree is in interior design? Or do I want to go get a master's degree? And they had a transitional program at the University of Florida. So um, I came to back to Gainesville and um, did my uh, three years of OT school there in Gainesville, where I was fortunate enough to work with a therapist, a physical therapist by the name of Carol Hugel, who's also on the faculty for the American Hippotherapy Association and an NDT therapist. And I volunteered with her for the whole three years that I was in grad school. I did my master's level research project was to develop a postural rating scale for the use for use during um, riding. And Carol's patients were my test subjects. So we did integrated reliability studies. And um, after that, I moved to Sarasota uh, because they had a, a hippotherapy program here in Sarasota that took the horses to the school. Um, I worked full-time in the school system where I'm also an assistive technology specialist. And on weekends, I worked in the hippotherapy setting. And, um, and then in 2019, I retired, came back to St. Petersburg. So, Linda, so are you telling me you were an interior designer before you became an OT and your experience volunteering led to that decision of becoming an OT? Absolutely. Um, When I was at the Chef Center, they had a physical therapist who came in and taught all the sections on disabilities. Because most of the people at the Chef Center were riding instructors, not 
therapists. And um, I came out of that experience thinking, do I want to be a PT or do I want to be, you know, I, I was thinking PT school after that. And then I went to a PATH conference, met up with an OT that I've known for quite a long time, talked to her and she said, with your background as a writer, you should be an OT and not a PT. Wow. So, and at this point, I'll give you a little anecdote that explains how that worked. Um, I was working alternating Saturdays with a PT who was not, had, did not have a strong writing background. We had a client who had had a traumatic brain injury. She had been writing for quite some time. She was very, very interested in learning how to be a better writer, even though she was in a hypotherapy program. And the PT looked at me and she said, we need to teach Liz how to do a pelvic tilt. So I thought, okay, what do we do as riders that integrates a pelvic tilt? And there's a maneuver called a half halt where you basically do a pelvic tilt and that's the cue to the horse that you're gonna ask for a change. So I taught Liz how to use a pelvic tilt to cue her horse that she was gonna transition from a walk to a halt. It was a much more effective way to teach her that move, the movement, in the context of something that was meaningful for her, which is very much an OT kind of right. um, thought process. And she was, because she was riding at that point an advanced dressage horse, she was able to, without hands, transition from walk to halt. But again, it was a really effective way to teach that skill. Had I not been a rider coming into it, yeah. I wouldn't have known that. There was a point in when I was in Gainesville and, and Carol and I were working together and we, the, the typical handhold that we use in, in a hippotherapy session would be our forearm over the thigh of the rider and the hand tucked in underneath. And at some point, Carol realized that during a downward transition from halt to walk, there was an internal rotation of the femur. We could facilitate internal and external rotation of the femur during those transitions if we were conscious of what was happening. So it, it's a subtle, you know, it's, it's a subtle movement. But um, again, with, with a lot of children who are participating in hippotherapy programs, one of the primary goals is either independent sitting or independent ambulation. Thank you for sharing your OT journey and how you, you transitioned into OT. Uh, your horse riding skills actually laid the foundation for you going into hippotherapy because usually sometimes it works in the opposite direction, doesn't it? It's very frequently in the opposite direction. direction. Um, there may not be a full understanding of the difference between hippotherapy and therapeutic horsemanship. Can you kindly give us some uh, of your input into what the difference is between hippotherapy and therapeutic horsemanship is? Sure. I'm, and I'm going to start this by giving you a little bit of history. Okay. There was a woman named Liz Hartel. She was, I'm pretty sure, from Denmark. Okay. Um, she contracted polio. Her doctors told her she would never walk again, forget about riding. I should go back and say she was at that point a world-class equestrian. She was already competing at international levels. Um, she has written, there, there are sections of a chapter on athletes who have overcome extraordinary hardships where she describes having her mother and her husband hold her up with a towel by her, at, by her trunk when she was trying to learn to crawl across the floor at the same time that her toddler daughter was crawling across the floor. So she refused to accept the doctor's um, prognosis and she started riding again. And she ultimately went to the Helsinki Olympics in 1952 and won a silver medal. And when she, in dressage, when she writes about it, she says it was significant for three reasons. Number one, it was the first time that women had been allowed to compete in the equestrian events. Number two, she won a silver medal, which was no small feat. And number three, the gold medal winning rider lifted her off her horse and carried her to the podium because she still couldn't walk independently. So after that accomplishment, with the number of post-polio patients that there were all over Europe and the United Kingdom, they didn't have enough rehab facilities, but they had lots of horses and lots of riding facilities. So 
the field of therapeutic horseback riding was born at that point, based on what happened with Liz Hartel. In 1990 or thereabouts, 18 occupational and physical therapists from the U.S. went to Germany to study what the German therapists were doing um, using the horse as a therapeutic tool. They came back and formed the American Hippotherapy Association, which started as a subset of, it's now PATH, it used to be the North American Handicap Riding Association. After a few years, AHA became a separate 501c corporation because they weren't entirely comfortable with the way PATH was um, interacting with them. And since then, there's been a, an ongoing conflict about terminology because with as with as with many things you know there's always a terminology issue the uh the term therapeutic writing which is what was the term that terminology that was coined originally back in the 1950s has become very very confusing for both parents and third-party payers they look at therapeutic writing which is basically teaching people with disabilities how to ride horses and hippotherapy, which is using the movement of the horse as a therapy tool, and they get very, very confused. So AHA for a long time has been advocating a terminology change. And they're saying we should be calling it adaptive riding because like any other adapted sport, like adapted skiing or adapted snowboarding or adapted anything, um, it would be more consistent with other adapted sports. So many facilities have all their branding done around therapeutic riding. And then there's also the issue of third-party payment. Uh, most third-party payers will not pay for your children to take riding lessons. They will pay for therapy. So we're, we're very conscious of it. It's just one of those things. Um, now, the American Hippotherapy Association has, I'm going to read to you the uh, definition um, that the AHA has published. The term hippotherapy refers to how occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech language pathology professionals use evidence-based practice and clinical reasoning in the purposeful manipulation of equine movement as a therapy tool to engage sensory, neuromotor, and cognitive systems to promote functional outcomes. Best practice dictates that occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech language pathology professionals integrate hippotherapy into the patient's plan of care, along with other therapy tools and strategies. Whereas, again, adapted writing is about teaching writing skills. And, okay, so we've got a little bit about the history of uh, hippotherapy and how um, horse riding became, uh, came to be used as a uh, therapeutic tool. Uh, can you Tell me a little bit about the benefits of hippotherapy uh, and, and horse riding uh, as a therapy tool, Linda, that you have seen in evidence in your practice. Because the horse has very rhythmic movement and the, the rate is predictable. I think the average horse takes about 100 steps a minute. So some estimates will say that in a typical 25-minute session, there are as many as 2,500 neuromuscular inputs. The horse's pelvis is also at a 90 degree angle to ours. So as the horse is walking, the just if, if the patient or client is doing nothing more than sitting on the back of the walking horse, the movement that the horse is providing stimulates lateral weight shifts of the pelvis, anterior-posterior weight shifts of the pelvis, and rotational movement of the pelvis, which are all components of normal ambulation. Depending on the horse, because every horse is a little different, the range of motion that's been measured is very, very close to normal human ambulation. Now, um, I think Mindy, Mindy's been talking on the uh, Wired Collective or the Wired on Development Group about the SATCO and when I first discovered the SATCO, I thought, ooh, how great is that? Because that helps me frame where I'm supporting patients. You know, I used to, um, I did a lot of what they talk about in the SATCO 
intuitively, like depending on the independence of the rider, sometimes my hand would be under the axilla, sometimes my hand would be mid thoracic, sometimes my hand would be on the pelvic crest. It just depended on how much support the rider needed. Sometimes I would have um, some kind of a support for the rider and my arm would be running all the way up the spine so that I could support the head. It just depended on the rider. But the SATCO gave me a framework to sort of say, okay, if I, if I quantify my levels of support in accordance with this tool, I can be more structured about the way I change the levels of support and, and reduce them. So I've had riders who started, I had one little girl who had, um, she had a heart attack when she was eight. Like she and her twin sister both had congenital heart defects that they didn't know about until her, until she stopped breathing. She presented very much like someone with cerebral palsy. So when I started with her, I did a lot of work where I put her in supine position because again, the rotation of the horse's pelvis would would simulate the same pelvic rotation and a lot of the movement that an infant would get if they were rolling to sit. Uh, again, I'm also an NDT certified therapist, so I do a lot, a lot of that development stuff. Eventually, when we had her sitting up, because her endurance was very poor, I would just have her count. I'd say, I want you to sit upright without your hands for a count of 10, uh, 10 steps. We'd take a break and then we'd go to 15 steps and we'd take a break and we'd go to 20 steps and we'd take a break. And eventually she was pretty much sitting independently. We had another little guy who had a diagnosis of SMA type two. When he started, he couldn't sit independently at all. He was bracing with his hands. He needed his hands to hold himself up. We could very, very short um, movement activities his mom got him involved in the, in the initial drug trials for that great drug that they have now. But once he actually started on the drug, we did the same thing with him. We would challenge him to hold a ball or clap his hands or just touch the sidewalker's hands or just do anything to keep from bracing with his, with his hands. And we count. I mean, I, I, he loved the phone. So I put the timer on for the phone and I challenge him to hold it, to keep, keep his hands up for 30 seconds or 45 seconds. So eventually his ability to maintain an upright posture without upper extremity support got better. I can't tell you, you know, how much better because I don't remember. Um, but again, we'd start with short stints and we'd just build up gradually over weeks. So I've had a lot of children develop much, much more stability in sitting posture. Um, I've had a lot of children develop um, more, more predictable ability to control their heads. Um, I've had one kiddo who developed um, a rudimentary communication system because he was, um, he was multiply impaired. He was blind. He was hearing impaired. He was non-ambulatory, tube fed, um, really, really involved kiddo. But one, of the, one day I was, I was transitioning onto the horse. And as soon as he got on the horse, I noticed that he was leaning forward, like he was anticipating that forward movement. So we started to, um, to play with that a little bit. And, and I thought, you know what? He's, he's getting it because it's so predictable that he's starting to anticipate what's going to happen. So we, and then he started to click. That was one of the things he did. He could click. So he would go and I would go and he would go and I would go. And that was just sort of a playful exchange. That's right. And then one day the horse stopped. And he was looking a little frustrated because the horse had stopped. And I said, you know, Gus, you can click to your horse and make him go. So you click twice to your horse and he'll go. And of course, by saying it out loud, the horse leader knew what I wanted her to do. So he went and she right away took off. So that cause and effect, he was, he was yeah, he put those right. two together. So, so for probably three or four months, we worked just on the, on the go. And then one of the things he would do when he, and, and I had to watch him for quite a long time to figure out how his behavior was telling me what he wanted to do. He would fling himself backwards, which was pretty dangerous because he was a tall kid too. And I thought, I wonder if that's a symbol that he wants to stop. Because what I, what I also realized he was doing was putting his hand out behind him before he'd fling over backwards. Like he's reassuring himself that there's something back there. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, Gus, I see 
that you're putting your hand behind you. And what I think you're telling me is that you want to take a break. So in the future, every time you put your hand behind you, we're going to stop. So that's what we did. And the sidewalkers would complain that we stop every three minutes. I said, I don't care if we stop every three minutes. This kid has one 30 minute section of, of his entire week where he has some control over what's happening. And if he wants to say, go and stop 50 times in the session, I don't care. Go and stop 50 times in the session. Um, but we did develop, a, you know, he was then, because I worked at the same school where he, that he attended, I was able to tell the vision impaired teacher and his classroom teacher that he knows stop and go. These are the symbols for stop and go. So it was integrated across, across settings. And I think that um, it really changed a lot of perceptions that people had about him when they realized that he had some ability to understand cause and effect. Um, Linda, you know, I, you talked about the communication and, and how that evolved for Gus through his writing. Uh, I just have to quickly mention this as well. I mean, I noticed with our writing how that actually improved uh, Kellen's trunk support, his air control, his volume control, to where his clarity and speech became. I know it's, I know we PTs and OTs, but honestly, I really believe that helped with his uh, 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 air volume control and his speech production. Good. I have a good friend who's an SLP, and she didn't understand how SLPs could use hypotherapy. Um, because there are a number of, of SLPs that are very involved in the American Hypotherapy Association. And I said, think about breath control. Think about what happens to you when you're not sitting up straight. So if we can get you sitting up straight and, um, and just the whole trunk piece of it. And plus there is, there is some research that says for some children, sitting on the back of a walking horse is an aerobic activity. That's some of the very, very early research on hippotherapy um, demonstrated that. So, because if you don't move normally and you're challenged just to do that, it becomes, an, you know, it's, it reaches the level of aerobics. So, it, it improves all your breath support and your, um, and think of all the Mary Massery stuff. And, um, Mary Massery was actually the uh, keynote speaker at the last American Hippotherapy Association conference. She's a huge advocate for hippotherapy and for kids with, um, who, need, who need to work on breath support. Would you say, what would your recommendations be, Linda, to a parent that is considering um, therapeutic horsemanship and or hippotherapy? What would, what would your advice to that parent be? Are there any children that hippotherapy may be better suited to? Are there any resources out there for parents to consider before they make that informed decision? I think, um, number one, the American Hippotherapy Association is the organization that trains therapists to utilize equine movement. The American Hippotherapy Association also utilizes the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship Standards for, um, for a, equine facilities as a reference. So and with the Path Center. Right. So within the PATH standards, there are contraindications and, and um, precautions. Among the contraindications are spinal fixation, because in the, the movement, sitting on a horse inherently involves movement. So if there's a spinal fixation, you're going you're gonna to exacerbate movement immediately above and below the fixed segments of the spine. Um, atlantoaxial instability of any kind. And there used to be a requirement that children with Down syndrome have um, x-rays before they ride. Some of that has changed. Any kind of behavior that would put either the horse or the horse handlers at risk. Um, horses are prey animals and their first instinct, if something startles them, is to run. And I don't care how fit you are, you're not going to keep up with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, and we, we do a lot to train our horses, but we've had, we've had children who are who, it, just the behaviors inconsistent with being safe on the back of a horse. Um, let's see. Spinal. We had, we had one rider. I think if you look at the path, um, 
path standards that tell you a spinal cord injury above a certain level is contraindicated. However, when I was working with Carol, we had a young man who had had a C7, incomplete uh, spinal cord injury when he was a teenager. He wanted to ride a horse. So um, she got a special team together. And I mean, this is a very experienced therapist. She had two handlers working with her who were also very experienced horse people. We spent a lot of time problem solving it. How we get him on, how we get him off. I should also mention he was six foot five. So um, he came out and he participated. Um, we initially tried a saddle. We, we tried a bunch of different things. I think it, um, he did ride in a saddle as opposed to a bareback pad for a long time because that helped being able to put his feet in stirrups was better stability for him. But he went on to go out west with his parents on a, um, to a dew branch and Carol sent the saddle out that he was using and they put the saddle on the horse and they got him on from the back of a truck. And he went, he went for a ride with his, with his family. And, um, but he was also, I say an incomplete spinal cord injury. He was, he could use both upper extremities. Um, he had some involvement of the ulnar side of his wrist. He was independent getting in and out of his car. He was independent folding up his wheelchair. He was employed. He was cognitively intact. He was verbal. He could monitor skin breakdown uh, so there were a lot of extenuating circumstances that led us to say, okay, let's try it with him, even though the standard says nothing above this level, <laughs> because he was an exception. But that means having an experienced therapist. That's right. Thank you again for your time, Linda. You're welcome, Marsh. Uh, let me know if you have any follow-up questions. I'll, I'll be around. <laughs> Absolutely, I will do that. And as I would, I would love to uh, share. I mean, uh, you sharing the history about that Danish uh, equestrian riders. I had no idea that that was even. I, mean, I had no idea about the history of uh, uh, hippotherapy, and you know when that started. And I think I always believe that's good. You got to know where things started off to get a sense of how fortunate we are to have what we have at present. Uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope it was helpful. Absolutely, ma'am. See you soon, okay? Okay, bye-bye. Guys, thank you so much for listening in with us today. Remember to give this podcast episode a rate and a review. And as always, if you need to contact us, we can be reached at raisingkillen at gmail.com. Thank you to Heating Horses for sponsoring today's episode. And guys, if you are in the Dyersburg, Tennessee area, Heating Horses will be holding their fifth annual Farm to Table event coming up on September the 23rd, which is a Thursday and just five weeks away. So stay tuned for more details about that. Until we see you guys the next time, remember, as always, get to the top of your mountain. This is Marsh Naidu signing off. Mm -hmm.